My name is Henne Holstegen, and today I'd like to tell you something about uh, genetic analysis uh, and the data sharing that takes place there, and I'll use Alzheimer genetics as an example. So first I'll tell you something about dementia. Um, when you look at the 80 year olds in our population, you can see that about one third of them will have dementia and the majority of them will have Alzheimer's disease. Now Im imagine that all of these individuals would also be able to turn 100 years, then at 100 years, they will almost all be demented. So this is really a big problem in our aging population and it's really something that we should do something about. But if you want to do something about Alzheimer's disease, the only thing that you can really do is prevent it. That is the only solution because the brain shrinks and holes appear in the brain. And, you know, there used to be cells in those holes and in those brains that have been lost and you can never get them back. So the only way to do something about Alzheimer's disease is prevent it from happening. So that also entails that we have to prevent before the onset of symptoms who will get Alzheimer's disease and who will not. And for that, we have to predict who will get Alzheimer's disease. And one way to predict who will get Alzheimer's disease is by using the genome. We know from twin studies that uh, 60 to 80% of Alzheimer's disease risk is defined by your genome. Unfortunately, we are not aware of all the genetic factors that are risk increasing that associate with the disease. So we have to compare large samples of individuals who have Alzheimer's disease and compare them with individuals who do not have Alzheimer's disease. And I can tell you a little bit how, how, about how we do this. Um, imagine that this is a piece of DNA that codes for the um, form of your nose. And in this case, the shape of the nose is a bit like this. But uh, the genome is made of four different molecules, G, T, C, and A. And imagine now that this piece of DNA is coding for this shape of nose. Now imagine that the A turns into a G, then perhaps the nose will be a little bit more like this. This means that this one small change of molecules can have a large impact on the way that, you, that we are built. It can also have a large impact on our vulnerabilities for different diseases, including Alzheimer's disease. So what we want to know, which of these changes in our DNA associate with an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. However, this is not easy because our genome consists of 3 billion of these beads. That's a three with nine, zero and nine zeros, and we call them three gigabase pairs. Now we also get one set from our father and one set from our mother. So we're actually looking at six gigabase pairs to analyze one genome. This also means that the amount of compute and the amount of storage that we need to analyze one genome is very, very large. We're looking at terabytes of data. And in fact, what we're doing now is we're looking at petabytes of data, which requires the necessary storage and compute, of course. This all goes to show that analyzing such large um, samples of genomes is a very complex research question. We also understand that when we want to look at one, these small changes, we're looking for needles in haystacks. These represent the, the small variants in our DNA. And it's not one variant, it's not two variant. It is, will be many different variants that together will um, define our increased or actually our risk of Alzheimer's disease. And some of these variants will have a large effect on uh, risk increase and some of the variants will have only a small effect of risk increase. But we need to identify which of these variants actually associate with a change in disease risk. So for that, we need to, co to compare very, very large groups of non-demented and demented individuals. And we're looking at tens of thousands of individuals that we have to compare. So in Amsterdam, we started to, to realize this in 2016, and we decided to compare, compare um, the data from Amsterdam with the data from Rotterdam. Um, and we didn't uh, decide to compare immediately the whole three billion base pairs, we decided to focus on a very small part of the DNA from which we already knew that something was going on there because some, some families had uh, changes there and we thought that we would be, that we could find more of these changes in that piece of genome 
uh, the SORO1 gene that might um, explain why some individuals would have Alzheimer's disease at a relatively early age. So we focused on the SORO1 gene, a small piece of the DNA, and we merged 640 Alzheimer patients and thir th almost 1,300 non-demented individuals, and we took their genomes and compared them. We then realized that this was a not trivial, so we had to uh, work on the supercomputer. So we then opened an account on the supercomputer, uh, the Cartesius supercomputer here in Amsterdam. And we were actually successful. When we did these analyses, we did find that um, individuals with Alzheimer's disease were much more likely to have a, a mutation or a, a molecule change in this SORO1 gene, and this, which did not or very, very uh, little occur in people with, without Alzheimer's disease. So we published this paper in 2017, and we were also able to tell what kind of disease uh, risk change uh, this SORO1 mutation had. But of course, we want to expand beyond one little piece of the DNA. We want to expand to the whole DNA. And um, so we, so from this, we learned that yes, it is super complex, but we can do it. Now we expand. So we also understood that we need many, many more genomes for this. And we were aware that in the United States, uh, similar um, um, uh, efforts were taking place and that the, the, that the researchers there had collected over 11,000 genomes. However, these genomes were sequenced, were generated by the, with funding from the NIH. And the NIH says, when we, when we fund your genome generation, you have to make the data available within three months. So we knew that this data was available. So we decided to request this data and we got approved. So we were able to download all of that data and merge it with the data that we already had here in Amsterdam. We, and, and by that time, that was almost 5,000 genomes. So we had a very large data set all of a sudden. Also, we were collaborating with other European Alzheimer disease researchers. And so we, we told them that we, had, that we had downloaded this data on our supercomputer and that we were also able to actually do these analysis because we had shown that we were able to do it. So we said this, so we had the 5,000 from the Netherlands, we had more than 11,000 genomes from um, the USA. Then uh, the UK decided to, 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 to send their genomes to the supercomputer and Spain and in France, more than 3,000. And then Germany decided to join and two more groups from the UK. So together we had on our server 20, more than actually almost 26,000 genomes and we were able to, um, to analyze these with, with one pipeline. And this is very, very important because when we first analyzed the Amsterdam and Rotterdam data, we realized that the Rotterdam data was a little bit different than the Amsterdam data. But we don't want to compare the differences between two cities. We want to compare the differences between having a disease or having no, not having a disease. So we needed to make sure that these batch effects is what we call them, needed to be taken away from, these, uh, from this large data set in a process called quality control, QC. So we really needed to QC these, all, all of this data very well, and it took us a long time to do it, but we succeeded. And so it, so we took, it took the whole of 2018 and 2019 to perform these analysis on the supercomputer, but in the July of this year, we were able to make our first publication when we uh, show that we're, there, there are three new genes that we find that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. You can also see a large number of authors here. That's because all these people from all these different countries are actually collaborators and they are uh, in fact um, very important. All of their efforts are very important to be able to do this. This is our collaboration. But we found three new Alzheimer genes and possibly also some uh, additional genes, but we need to do more analysis to actually confirm those. So now we have the discovery data set done so, uh, on, on these 26,000 genomes. But the uh, genetics field says, I will only believe it if you show it again in a separate independent data set. So we had to collect another 27,000 genomes and are now we are doing exactly the same analysis to see whether or not we can identify those same genes again, um, whether they associate with Alzheimer's disease or not. And here we again downloaded a lot of data from the US 
and we, we also generated our data ourselves and some data from France. Of course, in the future, we can merge these two uh, data sets into one very large data set. However, we are able to download the data from the United States. But, and now they have 27,000 uh, genomes made available, which we put on our server here in the Netherlands, and we now have 53,000 genomes. However, people from the United States would also like to look into our data. However, um, our data is not funded by the NIH. We have different uh, funders uh, who do not require us to make them publicly available. And what is also taking place is that we have now the GDPR, the General Protection Regulation, uh, which is a rule that which, which was implemented in May of 2018 that says that the genome from a person is the same thing as their name, as their address, as their photo, as their phone number, their date of birth, and you know whatever what else you have as your personal uh, from your personal identity. So um, given the GDPR, we cannot simply take somebody's genome and share it with somebody in the United States because in the United States, there are other privacy regulations uh, effective. So we are not able to share our data, which is becoming a little bit of an issue because um, uh, data sharing, as you can see, is extremely important. So uh, to, to, to quickly touch upon what is GDPR, um, we have to uh, have proper informed consent to uh, share a genome or to actually first analyze a genome and to share it with somebody else. And that is obviously necessary. But the GDPR also requires the implementation of the data processing agreement. So wherever you put your data has to, has to, um, has to oblige to all sorts of different rules of what a server should have with regard to protection, data protection. Um, so that uh, data leaks cannot take place. It's very, very protected environments. So as a consequence, it is very difficult to share data with the US because of these, all these different privacy regulations. And this uh, um, opinion was actually published uh, very, very recently in Nature, where it said that the, G the GDPR has stalled at least 40 clinical and observational studies. And in fact, our very own study, this, the study that I'm presenting here, was named in this piece. So it's becoming very much of a problem. What we want, of course, is progress. We want to share data. We know we need to share data. So to make this possible, we came up with a solution. If we uh, put all of the data on the Cartesia supercomputer, where it already is, from the United States and from the EU, we perform the quality control data to ensure that there is no more batch effect. We merge the data and then we transfer it to a new part of the supercomputer called Daphne. There we make the merged data available behind a very thick firewall with all sorts of authentication that needs to take place to, uh, to actually approach the data. But then we allow people from uh, the from the EU and also from the uh, from um, uh, the US, maybe also other regions from the world, to approach the data. They have to request access to specific data sets that are actually part of this merged data. And if they uh, get access, then they can approach the data. They will get an account, and then they can approach the data. So. Um, this is something that we are currently working on as a solution to this big GDPR problem. This makes Cartesius a hub for Alzheimer's disease genetics. So um, again, analysts or data analysts need to uh, gain relevant access to an approval to analyze these data. And then uh, analysts will get their own space on this Daphne supercomputer with 10 terabytes permanently available for storage and also large compute. If the compute will not be enough, then perhaps more can be made available. Um, uh, we will ask for a contribution uh, for people to access the data because we will need to host it and we will also need to uh, manage uh, the data access. And then uh, we want to ensure that none of the data can leave Daphne, hence a very, very thick firewall. Um, so if you want to take something off Daphne, found, you need to copy it to a specific part of Daphne where it will be automatically copied and then um, it, we will know exactly who took what from the, data, uh, from the data server and when and why and how much it was. And uh, we will not allow any data larger than 250 gigabases, um, uh, gigabit, gigabytes to, um, 
be removed from the server so that we can ensure that nobody can actually uh, download any uh, genetic data. So our goal is to um, make sure that as many as people as possible who can uh, analyze this data will be able to analyze this data because that is the only way that we can generate progress. So uh, we would like um, as many as people as possible to do this. We know that uh, not everybody is able to analyze this data. So we want the best bioinformaticians to be able to approach the data. We want to define uh, projects and we need to define um, who will join which project so that um, these projects can take place simultaneously. Um, we need to make sure that everybody can access the same data. And um, yeah, so to ensure that the most of the data can actually be uh, turned into results. We really need to understand that to succeed, we need to work together, not only the United States and Europe, but also people from other places in the world. And um, this is something that is ongoing. It's, it's not effective yet. Uh, we need to really work hard to get this going, but we hope to get this done somewhere in the next year. I'd like to um, acknowledge my collaborators, uh, specifically, of course, the ADES Consortium and the ADSP Consortium. Uh, and my funders um, who have helped me generate the data for our um, analysis. So if you have any questions, do let me know. Thank you a lot, Hannah, for this presentation. I think it's, um, it's very exciting to see that you had so many obstacles in actually sharing data and combining data and you sort of tackled them all. So I think this is really, really very exciting. And I think it's also interesting to see how for your field, the biggest challenge is actually not the community, um, but rather GDPR and some other legal restrictions that you have. So um, we don't have a lot of time for questions, but I'm just curious if there's a question from the chat. So I'm just going to give it a little bit. There's quite a lot of discussion in the chat, which is really nice to hear. Um, I'm not sure if there's a the direct question. Maybe for you, I was wondering, so your biggest next step in sort of realizing this pro program would then be to um, to sort of widen your network on in international collaborations. Is that is that the next step to say? Well, I think this this is actually already an, an international uh, collaboration. Um, so at this point, the ADIS consortium has to still be uh, formed as an as a, as a as a legal entity. So this is something that we are now currently working on. So obviously, I cannot decide for other international collaborators who gets to approach their data. They have to decide for themselves. But I think that if we put this data together like this, that if um, if somebody wants to work with the data that is from our own, you know, from our own community. Uh, in the first place, then uh, they can they can request the data, and then of course, if many people say yes, they they, they can be they can uh, the data can be used. Then I think that will also um, lead to other um, groups to say please also include our data because it'll only be you know it'll just um, uh, lead to everybody wanting to join. So I think if we take this first step. As a, as, as you know, as, if we say, okay, let's uh, let's take these twenty thousand genomes, and you can start analyzing. I'm sure that other people are just simply going to join as well. Mm -hmm. um, but but we, but I have to I have to really make sure that I cannot make that decision for them. I mean, they they have to de de decide for their own data what who can approach that. But um, so th there are also all these legal things that we are still working on. But I I I am confident that at least some of that will will be implemented soon. Mm -hmm. Thank you and uh, good luck with the project. I think it sounds very, very ambitious and I hope that indeed more people will join once yeah, once they see the benefit of this. Yes. Um, given the time, I would say um, we stop here. Thank you very much again for uh, being here and for presenting and feel free to join us for the rest and have a look at the chat. Um, there's a lot of discussion going on there as well. Okay, yeah. super. I'll have a look. Thank you Thanks. very much. Okay.